We are now introducing Professor Stephen Gouvea, that holds a PhD in Neurophilosophy of Mind from the University of Minho, Portugal. He has conducted research at the brain, Mind's Brain Imaging and Neuroethics Centers at the University of Ottawa with Professor Georg Nortov, that's also a speaker today. Currently, he's a research fellow at the Center for Philosophical and Humanistic Studies of the Universidade Católica Portuguesa and leads a six-year project on the ethics of artificial intelligence in medicine at the Institute of Philosophy, University of Porto. Professor Gouveia has an extensive publication record, including topics in philosophy and ethics of artificial intelligence in medicine, neurophilosophy of mind and cognitive science, and applied ethics, having authored and edited 13 books. He is also involved in research areas such as neuroscience and philosophy of consciousness, and that's probably one of the main reasons we invited him today, and predictive processing, democratic theory, and epistocracy. In addition to his scholarly work, he has delivered talks at academic conferences and public venues worldwide, and he has been featured in various media outlets, television, radio, podcasts, and magazines. He has also hosted an international documentary on artificial intelligence, which I suggest you search and find, where he carried out in-depth interviews with eminent academic researchers, very similar with what we plan on doing here, from around the globe to learn more about the issues like autonomous weapons, sex robots, autonomous cars, social media transparency issues, big data ethics, the role of governments and democracy in technological development, artificial creativity, human brain simulation technology, machine consciousness, technological immortality, technological unemployment, universal basic income, and many more. Stephen Gouveia is known for his online courses on diverse subjects, featuring renowned thinkers like Sir Roger Penrose, the Nobel Prize winner, Peter Singer, and Noam Chomsky. Only this bio shows us how amazing opportunities to have Stephen here with us. Stephen, thank you for being here, and I invite you to the talk. Thank you, Ron. Okay, so thank you very much for having me. Let's see if the PowerPoint will show up. So first of all, I'm very happy to be here. So my talk will be way more philosophical than the previous one. So I hope you have your glass of wine and uh, your Cuban cigar <laughs> to enjoy the talk. Um, so let me ask you, do you like philosophy? Like if you like philosophy, raise your hand. Oh, okay, a lot of people like. So it's interesting because if you look at on, on the top of the roof right now, on your right, yeah. you will see a bunch of areas related with human knowledge, right? But if you look right there on the right, on your right side, on my left, on the top, you will see the word philosophia, right? Which is the same in Portuguese that in Romanian. We say philosophy, philosophia as well. But you don't see neuroscience or AI, which is an interesting point, right? Because philosophy is one of the most basic and fundamental areas of human knowledge. And what I will try to do today is to tell you how we can combine philosophy, neuroscience, and AI to discuss or to think about, about consciousness. So uh, what I'm presenting will be based on my book. So I will give you now a couple of minutes so you can order the book. So take your time, don't worry. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm joking, I'm joking. Um, uh, okay, so my plan will be, I will, I will present you three uh, approaches that tries to combine philosophy and neuroscience. And this will be a bit abstract, so I will not show you a bunch of data and graphics. And then I will try to use some of the insight of that first part um, and apply it to AI. So there are many different uh, problems related with AI. And I will try to, to show you how we can combine philosophy, neuroscience, and AI and, uh, and consider different issues such as consciousness or agency or, 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 or subjectivity. So the first, the first introductory point I would like to make is that any academic discipline has its own method, right? So um, 
Philosophy usually uh, is focused on very particular uh, uh, issues, such as what is knowledge, or what is justice, or what is the mind, the human mind. And neuroscience also deals with other different problems, such as what are the mechanisms in schizophrenia, for example. And we know that philosophy usually shares a bunch of uh, methods that we call it a priori. So usually they are just conceptual methods, and they don't require any investigation into the world. So if you take the example of the proposition here, so all singles are unmarried, in order to understand the truth of this proposition, you don't need to like to do a huge study in the entire world and check every single single person if they are unmarried or not, right? So you just need to understand the concepts of, of the sentence and by, by, by presupposing specific definitions, you will be able to understand the truth or the falsehood of that sentence. Of course, with neuroscience, it's actually the opposite. So if you do philosophy, or if you do neuroscience as you do philosophy, you will be quickly fired because you cannot do neuroscience without looking into the world, without doing experimentation, without doing controlled research. <clears throat> so what, uh, what I'm trying to say here is that at least traditionally, there is a, a very big difference between philosophy in one side and neuroscience in the other. Philosophy is traditionally an a priori methodology, and neuroscience is traditionally an a posteriori um, methodology. The first approach that tries to think this relationship between philosophy and neuroscience is what uh, has been called the isolationist approach, or by other authors, such as Georg Nordhoff, a parallelism approach. And I think its name offers already some clues, right? So the isolationist approach argues that philosophy and neuroscience cannot work together exactly because they are methodologically different. So because they are so dissimilar, because one is essentially an a priori methodology and the other is essentially an a posteriori methodology, it's basically uh, incorrect to assume that we can combine both methodologies in order to study the conscious mind. So uh, one of the most uh, interesting books on, on the subject um, is the one from Brozek, and he claims something like the isolationist projects are based on the assumption that the findings of natural sciences, neuroscience included, do not influence directly the practice of philosophy, as at least some aspects of philosophical reflection are independent or of empirical facts investigated by scientists. <clears throat> so you can see clearly how or where the isolationist uh, intuition is working on, right? Because neuroscience is empirical and because the philosophy is not empirical, it's conceptual, then we, they cannot work together. And I think a perfect example of this approach is the book by Peter Ecker and Max Bennett called Philosophical Foundations of Neuroscience. Some people claim that this is one of the most brilliant uh, books in philosophy of mine in recent years. I think this, this is not... <laughs> I'm not sure this is a, a true statement, but anyway, the, the goal of this book is to try to show how current new science is full of countless conceptual confusions, and this is influenced by the history of neuroscience and related with a lot of what they call a crypto-Cartesianism. So it means that the ideas of Descartes are still influencing neuroscientists today, and in that sense, this book is, is an interesting work because it shows specifically in different research areas of neuroscience how Descartes, which is a whole philosopher, is still influencing a lot of neuroscientific concepts that we have today. The idea here is that um, neuroscientific concepts are different from philosophical concepts. So imagine, um, imagine uh, what is a neuroscientific concept such as prefrontal cortex activity. This is a concept that can be true or false, but for them, philosophical concepts are not like that. So imagine the concept of free will or consciousness. These are not related with what is true or what is false, but are related with what makes sense and what does not make sense. So philosophical concepts are about meaning and uh, neuroscientific concepts are about truth. 
And they argue that because of that, we cannot unite again the two disciplines to study the conscious mind. <clears throat> the main argument basically has this very simple formalization. The first premise argues that philosophy is methodologically based on the a priori. The second premise argues that neuroscience is methodologically based on the a posteriori. Therefore, and because a priori and a posteriori methodologies are incompatible, therefore we conclude that philosophy and neuroscience are methodologically incompatible. So, if you look at this structure, you can, you can see that because three is presumed, that is, because different methodologies are incompatible with each other, and since philosophy is based on one and neuroscience on the other, then they are methodologically incompatible. So, we can see here that if we work on this tradition, there is no chance of having any kind of relationship between philosophy and neuroscience. They will remain separate, and I think this is a problematic uh, issue that we need to, to think ways to solve it. First of all, I think that um, the argument uh, assumes a very specific definition of philosophy that might be wrong. So if you follow, for example, Daniel Dennett, which is a philosopher in the States, um, he rejects this view by claiming that philosophy is actually linked to the physical sciences and is effectively its continuation. So if you reject the metaphilosophical definition of philosophy as a pure a priori methodology, then you can open some, some ways to consider a philosophical interaction with neuroscience. Um, one of the most interesting ideas of the of Peter, Peter Ecker book is what they call the Muriological fallacy of neuroscience, which claims that is the principle that psychological predicates that only applies to human beings or other animals as a whole cannot intelligently apply to their parts. What does that mean? A lot of neuroscientists, they do this very generic um, claims about the brain, right? So here you can see the Portuguese neuroscientist Antonio Damasio claiming something like the brain decides. And you can see Edelman also saying the brain categorizes and discriminates. So here the brain is a subject of a predication, right? But the point of, of um, Peter Ecker is to say that it doesn't make sense to say that the brain decides because only a human being can decide. The brain is just a part of what a human being is, and it doesn't make sense to use psychological predicates to, and apply them to specific parts of your, of your body. It would be like to say that your hand thinks or your eyes see. It's not your, it's not your eyes that sees, it's actually you as a person that see and hear and think and dream. And I think, um, Although this is interesting, I think, because of what I said before, I think there are many different uh, problematic uh, ideas, because I also think that philosophical concepts can actually be tested empirically. And I also think that empirical concepts can be tested philosophically, let's say. Uh, I will show you this uh, after, but for now, I would like to show you this idea by Wittgenstein. So, it's interesting because we can use uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein, which is ironic because Wittgenstein is the main philosopher that Peter Ecker uses in his book to describe all these fallacies of neuroscience. But you can also use Wittgenstein and the concept of language games to argue against this isolationist approach. So Wittgenstein, uh, in his philosophical investigations, presented the concept of language games and the aim was to show how words cannot be understood outside the context they are used. So it might well be the case that, in fact, it can make sense to use psychological predicates to the brain if we consider that we are facing a language game that is different from the game of what we call ordinary language or common language. And we also can extend the subpersonal level to the pragmatic application of terms and concepts that can be made at the personal level. So, what we can say is that um, Ecker and Bennett commit a sort of petitio PCP fallacy because they presuppose a bunch of rules, but they never show these rules. And because of that, if we don't have rules, we don't have limits, and then we cannot have a plausible uh, idea. If 
the isolist approach has these problems, how can we think different ways of relating philosophy and neuroscience? The next uh, approach is called the reductive approach, and basically it will argue that we should reduce uh, philosophical concepts to neuroscientific concepts. So, um, the reductive approach basically argues that the mental concepts such as mind, consciousness, perception, um, mental disease in general, uh, etc., should be replaced by an equivalent brain-reduced concept. This was made famously by Patricia Schurzland, uh, where she tried to use a very specific uh, mechanism called the interact in the, the intellectual uh, reduction and. The idea is to start with an operational concept, for example, uh, consciousness, and then you do your experimenta, uh, experimental research, and then you can achieve uh, um, a more solid uh, definition from the, the previous one. Um, the idea here is, is then that we should, or at least what Patricia Scherzen tries to argue for, is that neuroscience should gradually uh, substitute and eliminate any kind of philosophical investigation. Why? Because all the concepts related with the mind are concepts that are not useful nowadays to, 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 to deal with what it means to be human, to, do, to understand what it means to be a brain and to be a mind. So, this is of course a very reductive, right? So, the idea is that if you look the, uh, if you want to solve the problem of consciousness, you just need to look into the brain, and you do research in the brain. But this, is, this can be problematic philosophically, but also empirically, right? And uh, another approach to relate uh, philosophy and neuroscience is what we call a neurophenomenological approach. And this uh, new approach agrees that we can have a rela relational, um, um, a relational uh, structure between philosophy and neuroscience, but it's a mistake to reduce all the concepts of the mind to the brain. And on the shoulders of many different uh, philosophers, like Husserl, like Merleau-Ponty, or like Heidegger, um, they argue that we can actually combine different methods of philosophy and neuroscience, and we can use them to, to do research. Um, they also argue that for example, that five-hero bill. If you look at the five-hero bill and if you use a microscope to check the entire bill, you would never find the value of the euro in the bill, right? So the idea is that if you look at the brain, you will never be able to find where consciousness is because consciousness is not part of the brain. It's again part of the brain plus your body plus the interaction of your body with the environment. And this is very relevant for a lot of mental disease where you have a, a discontinuity between how you feel and how the world feels to you. Take, for example, schizophrenia or dementia or, or other kind of uh, examples like that. So, if you look at the bill, you will never find the value here. What um, the value of the, of the euro is in the combination of very specific rules, marketing, uh, economical and financial rules. And only when the bill is certain in that kind of economical environment, it will have some meaning, right? And consciousness should be seen as something similar. So we should not look for consciousness in the brain, but we should have a more holistic uh, approach to, to, to neuroscience. But of course, there is a problem with this approach as well, because, um, um, yeah, so my slides are not, like, coordinated, but is there any way we can coordinate that? But if not, don't worry. So, Francisco Varela is, um, is one of the... Um, so, this guy is one of the, the founders of neurophenomenology. He argued that... Uh, no, back. Yeah, more. Yeah, that's it. Okay, thank you. Um, Francis Crivella is one of the founders of, of this uh, approach, and he argues that the mind is embodied, is inactive, is embedded in the world, and is extended. So your mind can be extended by the use of your cell phone, for example. You can extend your memory in some sense. You can also use a, a, 
You can also make notes with, uh, with, uh, with your pen, and this is an extension of your cognitive process. <coughs> And here, the idea is to create a neuroscience that will be influenced by a phenomenological uh, approach and will lead to better results. So again, we are in a relational uh, situation between philosophy and neuroscience. However, it's not very clear what are the metaphilosophical assumptions of this approach. Because first, this approach is very based on the idea of interception. And a lot of philosophers think that interception is problematic because it's too biased, you are too focused on your own thoughts, and maybe it's not a useful instrument for objective data related with the, with the mind and the brain. And actually, phenomenology also has a, uh, many, many different authors work on many different methods, so you cannot find one method that every neurophenomenologist agree on. And I think this is problematic because, for example, Francisco Varela, uh, the founder, uh, told, told us that we should not see neurophenomenology as an heuristic of neuroscience, given that he has a lot much to offer than just this mere complement. But other proponents of this approach, such as, for example, Antonio Lutz, argue in the opposite direction. So the advantages of this uh, neurophenomenological approach is precisely its heuristic capacity to guide empirical research in general to achieve new results. So we are at the end um, with a, an approach that is metaphilosophically inconclusive, and because of that we can present a, a final approach. The final approach is a non-reductive approach, well, not this one. So, yeah, slides are again not coordinated. So can you switch the... Yeah, exactly, thank you. Um, the non-reductive approach is based on what we call a cooperativism or cooperative naturalism and argues that there, there should be a relationship between philosophy and this should be seen as an intermethodological cooperation between the two. This position is clearly in the opposite direction of the reductive approach that I told you about. And in this uh, approach, what we do is we first take a philosophical concept as an input to develop an operational criteria to do an empirical research. And next, we use that empirical research where we find some specific data and facts. And then we compare those uh, specific facts with the previous definition that we had before. And this will lead basically to this... Oh, of course, this methodology was created by Georg Nortov, who is here. Raise your hand if you are here. You are? <laughs> right there. And this, this methodology was created by Georg Northoff, so the idea is that there is always an interactive way of combining the philosophical side and the empirical side. So in any time of your research, you should always compare what you are doing, and then once you do this in, in many different stages of your research, you'll be able to create a sort of neuro-philosophical concept. And this means what? This, those are the books that uh, Georg developed this idea, Mining the Brain and the Spontaneous Brain. You can take five minutes to order them if you want as well. Uh, they are very interesting. I spent like almost five years just researching on these two books. So Georg, you should stop writing so, so much interesting stuff, please. <laughs> and um, the hallmark then is always this interactive way of thinking philosophy in neuroscience. And I think with this approach, we have a more precise and clear methodology that will end up relating philosophy and neuroscience in a continuous way. And this could be more successful to, to deal with the, with the problem of consciousness in our scientific world. And now, so I told you about philosophy and neuroscience and how I can, we can think the interaction between the two, but what about artificial intelligence? So how can we apply some specific methods of philosophy to consider different impacts and consequences of AI technological development? I think we can actually use uh, phenomenology and AI as a case test for this kind of interactive uh, exchange. We know that the developments in the field of AI raise many different philosophical questions that can profoundly change our thinking about various mental concepts, such as what it means to be a conscious subject, how perception works, how human interacts with their environment via their body, and so on. But oddly enough, these new developments, from machine learning to, de to deep learning and also artificial neural networks, have not been the primary focus of philosophical deliberation, even though more traditional uh, 
AI ways of thinking have actually been uh, been um, been uh, considered. So um, again, the slides are not <laughs> correlated. So so can you go one? Yeah, thank you. No, it's the other direction. Yeah, thank you. So. For example, regarding traditional AI, so Hubert Dreyfus contended that computer lacks embodied capabilities related to our lived experience of, of the world. Uh, Don uh, claimed that technology is not neutral, but shapes our subjective experience of the world. And Gallagher argues that embodied cognition paradigm based on the relevance of how our body experience shapes our subjective experience can provide an appropriate framework to develop intelligent systems. So as a philosophical approach that focuses on the study of the universal structures of subjective experience and how people perceive and interpret the world, I think phenomenology can be a valuable insight when we apply it to AI in general. So for example, we can better understand how people interact with the intelligent system and how these systems can be made more user-friendly uh, and effective, but also by using AI models to simulate different scenarios that allow researchers to examine hypothetical situations and understand how people may actually respond to different stimuli. We can also use simulated embodied uh, agents and see how they can uh, enhance their performance. And this can be, of course, particularly useful when you study complex and dynamical uh, phenomena, such as emotions, such as social interactions, cultural practices, and actually mental illness in general. Because all these concepts are very difficult to research on when you use traditional research methods. And this more um, virtual um, embodied approach can actually be useful to, to do research on those specific um, phenomena. Other relevant uh, issues are related to topics such as how the internet can be considered a new kind of cognitive ecology, the impact of re virtual reality on the 4E approach to the mind, or how research in robotics in general can be improved by making use of the 4E cognition framework, or even philosophical debates raised by the existence of large models, large language models such as ChatGPT by OpenAI. So the big question regarding ChatGPT is the question of how or if there is a relationship between linguistic behavior performance and subjectivity, right? So I'm not sure if you know about ChatGPT. I think you all know, right? If you interact with that system, you will see that it's quite, it's impressive in some sense, right? Because most of the time it's very current, um, and you will get better and better because the the base of the technology is to improve by by its use. And of course, there there was this big the debate about the Google engineer, right? That thought that uh, a specific uh, language model was conscious, and he was actually fired after that, which is funny. Um, so there is a big debate about how your linguistic behavior in this case, but also behavior in general, can be a predicted um, uh, structural um, input of consciousness or subjective experience in general. And of course, phenomenology can also provide, um, can also provide, uh, <laughs> Okay, ChatGPT. Yeah, something. Okay, so can you go back a few slides? So of course, um, one, two, no, uh, no, no. So this, the the not the last one, but the before that. More? Um, no, more. One more to the right. One more? Okay, good. So, of course, if you consider phenomenology um, or a phenomenological approach to consciousness, you will see that consciousness isn't considered embodied, it's considered dynamical, it's considered a situated, have a situated nature, and it's constantly in flux, shaping and being shaped by the reality. And of course, this can inspire AI researchers to develop intelligent systems that are more flexible and are more adaptive, they can respond to the environment rather than just simply to follow very specific pre-programmed rules or, or 
or structures. So the idea is that if you follow what the current AI uh, is doing, I'm not sure you will be able to ever develop a conscious artificial intelligence because the like the definition this, that is principles of consciousness is a very uh, non-dynamical, very non-situated one. And I think that if you want to make some um, improvement on AI, you should, you should consider this uh, idea of phenomenological consciousness more seriously. So to sum up, I think we can combine, or this combination of phenomenology and AI can provide new ways of understanding subjective experience and consciousness in its broader sense, and it can also influence how the practice of AI can be improved and understood via this phenomenological approach um, in general. So to sum up uh, and to finish my talk, I think that if you consider philosophy, neuroscience, and AI, in a dynamical way, I think you will be better suited to try to solve the problem of consciousness instead of just doing philosophy or just doing neuroscience or just doing AI. I think you need, we need to combine our efforts and uh, that will be the only way to create more progress in the, in the studies of consciousness. You can see my website for my books, my online courses and my talks, and I thank you so much for, for having me here. Thank you so much, Stephen, for this tour de force. It was enlightening and highly stimulating, especially for someone that younger than you follows the footstep. Are there any questions from the public? We have time for one question before we take a, a short coffee break. And uh, I remind you to post your questions in the Let's Chat section of the Mindscapes.ro in the right, bottom corner. Anyone there have a question? Then I will... Oh, perfect. Awesome. <laughs> I didn't see you. I'm sorry. Thank you very much for this presentation. You mentioned in passing the four E's. Yeah. Would you care to tell us which are the four E's? Oh, so it's extended? in the way that your cognitive abilities can be extended to your like, world. The example of using a cell phone to remember something. So you took notes of my talk, probably, or maybe not. And th those are like uh, specific environmental uh, tools that you can use to enhance your memory, for example. So the first one is extended. The second one is embodied. So it's the idea that your mind is not brain reduced, but it's actually embodied in the sense that for example, the shape of your ears influence how you will perceive my voice right now. And that's why everyone is having a different experience regarding the perception of my voice, because you all have very different uh, ears, and of course these are microscopic, so you cannot see them, but they actually are very different, and all of these influence the way you perceive the world. The, second, the third one is the idea of embeddedness. So it's the idea that you, you as a body and the brain, you are embedded in the world. You are not isolated. You are in a constant um, dynamical situation with, with your world. And that defines how you perceive the world and how you connect with, with, us, with that world. And finally, you have the inactive, which means that you um, so take, for example, um, dementia or schizophrenic patients, right? The way they relate with the world is very different from how a normal body and brain does it. So the inactive structure is problematic in that sense. So there needs to be a very specific balance between how your body and your organs work and how the world is, is, is working. So these are the four approaches, and I think they can be useful to apply them to AI, for example, right? Because nowadays, I, I think AI people are very uh, ba based on th this reductive approach that in order to simulate or to emulate the, the conscious mind of humans, we just need to focus on emulating the brain. And I think this will not take you far because we are not a brain, we are a brain plus a body plus 
the environment. And we should take into consideration this uh, for sure. I, I would have a suggestion for the theater, which was to, to add neuroscience and AI in the, in the roof, right? Because that's, that's the way I see we can make some progress in consciousness, so philosophy should not be alone there, yeah. For sure, that's a, that's a good suggestion. Anyone else that has a question? For sure, please. There is a follow-up and then yeah, we can take other you. questions. Thank you very much uh, for reminding us. Now I realize that they were, um, they were yeah. explained uh, before. Do you see this enlarged approach somehow um, coming closer to the um, oriental philosophies mm. which see not only the physical body, but a mental body right. that is much larger than what we see. Yeah, so that's an interesting point because Francisco Varela, who, is, who, who was the main creator of this uh, neurophenological approach, he was very influenced by ideas from, from the, the other world, right? So, um, the other world. <laughs> no, not the other world, yeah, you, you got it. So, and he worked a lot with meditation, for example, because meditation is a very interesting tool to consider consciousness because you can impose an altered state of consciousness by your own uh, like mental abilities so it's a good idea to compare like the brain of uh, someone who is meditating versus a normal brain and you can see differences specific differences which can be uh, not the answer but at least they can give you some hints about how consciousness is realized in the human human body but uh, yeah that's a really good idea because a lot of philosophy is very focused on ancient Greece and philosophical theories of ancient Greece, but maybe we need also to consider other cultural traditions to, in order to, to have a more progress in the study of the conscious mind. Yeah. Right there? Thank you. Okay. Yeah, hello. Uh, first of all... Oh, it's not working. First of, all, first of all, it's not maybe a question, but um, a request if you can comment on something. Mm -hmm. uh, I couldn't help but notice the similarities with systems theory, you know, from automatics. Right. So maybe you can comment a bit on this. Um, and the other one, it's at some point, it was at least for me a turning point in your presentation, mm -hmm. where you said that introspection is generally regarded as being too subjective. Right at least in a scientific approach. Yeah. But on the other hand, we are talking about something that you cannot touch, you cannot mm -hmm. define in a scientific way. So if you can comment a, a bit on this aspect, yeah. on the subjectivity of introspection, I think it was too briefly dismissed. Right. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point, because like introspection is a very hard concept to deal with, right? Because it's very biased and... Um, but even Francisco Varela assumes, for example, this, that the way he talks about introspection is not the way we usually consider what introspection is. Usually introspection is this idea that you own, have your own perceptual experience of the world and that it's really hard to talk about it. So even if you try to use language to translate what you are feeling when you taste uh, an apple, for example, the flavor of the apple, it's very hard for someone to have the exact same flavor if they never had an apple uh, before, right? So this is the idea that introspection is very subjective, it's very private. But actually, Varela thinks that we can redefine the concept of introspection to another one which is more useful. And this is connected with the, basically the universal structure of the mind. So for Varela, there are specific uh, structural uh, uh, ideas related with the introspection, which is the idea that, for example, every thought happens in time and space. So time and space are sort of uh, structural uh, fundamentals of thinking. And uh, it's interesting because Varela thinks that introspection in this way is actually totally objective. So you can get it, you can study it in a lab because of that. So in the, in the, in, in the case of the human mind, you may consider, for example, a brain that doesn't process the time well, schizophrenic, for example, and you can compare that to a normal brain. And this is like introspective in the sense that nothing happens uh, outside time and space. 
And this is a way of solving the problem of introspection. I'm not sure this works, but at least it's a good attempt to, to try to solve it. So the idea is to redefine the concept of introspection. Yeah. <laughs>